Hello and welcome back to Film Bully Base. I'm here as always with my co-host. Logan Albright, welcome. And we're here to talk about The Northman. That's right, it's the brand new film, the highly anticipated brand new film from director Robert Eggers, known for such independent classics as The Witch and The Lighthouse. Which we've seen both of those. We have. We talked about The Lighthouse when we were in Ireland like three years ago, remember? We did. We did. That's one of my favorite episodes, and that's actually one of our most watched entries here on Film Boy Base. So you, if you haven't seen it, click here or down below. Logan will figure that out. Somewhere. Uh, and we've never talked about The Witch uh, officially, but maybe we will. I love The Witch. It's one of my favorite horror movies of the last 10 years. I think it's very original and very scary and very well acted and very well directed. It's his debut feature, like an amazing film. So uh, I also like The Lighthouse a lot. So I was very highly anticipating his next work and very excited to see what Mr. Eggers was going to do next. So you saw this film a few days ago and Joe and I saw it last weekend. So it's pretty fresh and I'm ready to get going. Okay, so this has a all-star studded cast, Nicole Kidman, We've got uh, Ethan Hawke, everyone's favorite heartthrob from the mid-90s and beyond, Alexander Skarsgård, Anya Taylor-Joy, Willem Dafoe, even Bjork has a, has a nice role in this. And who am I missing? Those are the main yes. players. Um, you can tell there's some, some Eggers favorites in there. Willem Dafoe from The White House and Anya Taylor-Joy from The Witch. Both excellent actors. I'm glad to see you again. We both really liked Anya Taylor-Joy's performance in One Night in Soho. Or Last Night in Soho. <laughs> I was thinking One Night in Bangkok. But yeah, I mean, that was a big reason why I wanted to see Last Night in Soho, because I like her so much. She's great. She's so, so good in Soho, and we both really liked that film. It was both one of our top films of 2021. But anyway, uh, Ethan Hawke, he is, plays... Should we give them a little bit of the backstory here? Okay, so the the basic outline of the Northmen, it's a it's an Icelandic saga, or a, I don't know if it's actually Icelandic, but a Scandinavian saga uh, retelling of a kind of classic revenge story, a story of loss and betrayal and vengeance, a uh, fairly standard medieval romance fair uh, involving a young prince whose father is betrayed and murdered by his brother, who has to then go into isolation to avoid being killed and swears vengeance and to reclaim his kingdom one day. Uh, it may sound familiar to viewers because it's the exact same plot as Hamlet and the Lion King. And what is really neat is that there are some iconographical moments within the film that point directly back to Hamlet. The main character's name is very similar. There is a moment where the father's skull is held, which is probably the, the most distinctive moment of Hamlet. If you can think of a moment in your head as probably somebody holding a skull. And, and what else? Just kind of the general plot. Yeah, I mean, it should be noted that Shakespeare got the idea for Hamlet from this saga rather than the other way around. So, um, you know, he's not copying Hamlet, he's copying the original saga, um, Eggers is in this. So, I mean, I would say it's, it's, you know, fairly archetypical in terms of plot, which I generally like. It also comes with the downside of being a little bit predictable, because if you're at all familiar with these type of stories or Western canon, you're kind of going to know from beat one where this is going to play out. So that's a little bit of a downside, but, you know, I will really like kind of medieval romances and that style of um, storytelling. And I, uh, I recently read a book that had a lot of the same elements. It was a, a fantasy novel called The Broken Sword. Uh, beautiful, wonderful novel you should read if you haven't, but it's got a lot of the same beats in it, a little bit, few more modern twists and turns, but it reminded me very much of the same type of story. So I like that, that aesthetic, and that's something that's very cool. And I like the, the Viking stories and Scandinavian tales. So I was into it from the beginning, and I think it's a, it's a good subject matter for Eggers to delve into because it's the kind of thing that I think he does well kind of dealing with folklore and like historical uh, stories that he he's heavily researches. Like for example, in The Witch, he's, it's all dialectically accurate. Like he has all this 16th century uh, Puritan dialect in there and you, he's kind of taking the same attention to detail and bringing it over to this um, to Scandinavian story. Which I think takes place in originally in eight, eight, uh, 895 AD. So quite a long time ago, very far removed from when Shakespeare wrote Hamlet. 
So it is, it is quite a precursor to that. Now, one scene in this that everybody I know that's seen this has mentioned to me is the Valkyrie and how terrifying she looks. And also, I'm asked, is she wearing braces? She is not. So what looks like braces is actually a tooth tattoo. And so how he's imagined this, because these were never associated with Valkyries, but only with male warriors, is that they would carve into their teeth and then fill the gap with a, a, a resin-like substance. And that's why it ends up kind of looking like the anachronistic, very anachronistic braces. I'm not a dontological expert by any means, but I don't think orthodontics really rose to prominence until the last 100 years, probably more like 50, 50 years. So uh, she's not wearing braces. However, she is legit terrifying and she's a, a beautiful Scandinavian model. I loved her. I loved Ethan Hawke. I wish he had been in more of it. Uh, there's something about Ethan Hawke's career in, I would say, the last decade where he has been choosing some really interesting projects. He's been doing these independent horror films, uh, a couple of them that you've probably seen that started franchise, and I'm not talking about just The Purge, but about, um... oh, help me out here, Logan. It's the, uh, the research that makes this program good. Let's see. Um... Well, while you're looking that up, I'll say also... Um... I really like Nicole Kidman in this, and I've historically been a detractor of Nicole Kidman. I haven't really been impressed with her acting in general throughout her career. I resent her performance in Eyes Wide Shut as being not very good, and I love Stanley Kubrick, and I feel like she kind of ruined one of his his final film. Um, so I've never really liked Nicole Kidman much, but I think i got to give her props because in the last couple of years, I feel like she's trying to revitalize her career and is taking more uh, actorly roles and more interesting roles and really diving into them and doing a great job with them. I saw her in uh, the uh, Being the Ricardos, where she played Lucille Ball, and I thought she was fantastic in it, and I thought she was fantastic in this. So I think she's kind of moving away from, as she gets a little older, moving away from these like leading lady performances and doing something a little bit more character actor, a little bit more uh actorly a little bit more um, in depth and she's taking them seriously and doing a really good job and so I got to give her props for kind of making a comeback and she's reunited with her HBO Big Little Lies co-star Alexander Skarsgård which is neat except now instead of a husband and wife they're playing mother and son uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit about Ethan Hawke he plays the king in this and he isn't in this a lot, but he has a, a lot to chew on. He has been picking really interesting roles for the last decade or so, I think. Starting with Sinister, an independent horror film that launched a so-so sequel. And, you know, also The Purge. But some just very tantalizing offerings, like First Reformed. And now he's in The Moon Knight on Disney, uh, which is a Marvel property. But he has really just been selective in what he's picking. He's done a lot of independent films. Uh, he's had a just a very steady career since the mid-90s when he rose to fame from the, or, the original uh, Before Sunrise art, uh, Richard Linkletter, not Art Linkletter, Richard Linkletter's trio of films. So he's in this not long enough. Um, and then I, why don't you chat a little bit about Bjork? Oh, yeah. So Bjork uh, gets to, you know, a lot of this movie takes place in Iceland. I think it's filmed in Ireland, actually, but it takes place in Iceland. And uh, there's a part where the main character is experiencing a vision telling him of what he needs to do to enact his revenge. And the, the character in the vision is played by Bjork, the quirky Icelandic songstress. And uh, she does a great job. So it's a one scene performance, but she's really cool. And it. it's nice to see her in films. I think that Robert Eggers is really like an actor's director. Because like he's got his own cinematography feel and he's got his own um, you know style in terms of a director, but I like I think where his real strength is is identifying and uh, identifying great actors and getting great performances out of them because that's been a constant throughout all the movies that he's made is that the performances are just fantastic and the actors he chooses are right for the roles and really good. So you got to give him credit for that. I'd like to talk a little bit about the cinematography. So the light the lighthouse is. Black and white, and I think I called it in our review like a surrealistic, um, you know, nightmare or something like that, uh, day trip. But it's daydream, surrealistic daydream. And you have some of that here. However, most of the film is in color, and you will notice the very green hills where they are shooting. 
but then there is very judicious use of complete black and white. Did you notice that? Yeah, it's done um, very sparingly, and it's done in a way that you almost don't even notice it because it's folded in very seamlessly. But yeah, he, he's good at that sort of thing. I think his his cinematographic uh, feel and uh, style is really present in all of his films, and you he has sort of a little bit of a dreamlike quality to what he's doing. He likes to have fantasy sequences. He likes to have things that you're not really quite sure what's real and what's not. One thing I will say is I was I was relieved to find that he wasn't continuing his march towards narrower um, aspect ratios. I was worried that this was going to be a vertical bar because the lighthouse was a, like a four by three. And I was just didn't want him to keep getting narrower and narrower in the aspect ratios. This is back to a you know widescreen presentation. But, it, you know, filmed in Ireland for the most part, gorgeous green hills, gorgeous landscapes, um, great kind of period accurate uh, set design and costume design. Everything looks beautiful. Uh, I think it's it's visually great. And I don't know that it's necessarily a step forward from anything he's done in the past. It's a little bit less experimental than The Lighthouse, certainly. But uh, he's he's holding his own in terms of making quality films. So the research that I did on how he prepared for this is that he wanted this to be as accurate as possible to the time period and the geographical location. So that's why even the domiciles that everyone lived in, to the costuming, to what they ate, and what kind of flora and fauna that you may see, he has done research on that and has made it as as realistic as possible from what we know of the eight uh, the eight hundreds, early nine hundreds. Think you know J.R. Earl Tolkien, Lord of the Rings, how Peter Jackson really delved into making that, although that's a that's a fictional place but how he made that as accurate as possible to the books. Did you feel that like dedicated sense to accuracy when you were watching it? You don't only get it from the the look of everything, but you get it from just kind of the feel of the culture, I think. Like there's a real, this it's a very violent movie and there's a real sense of the kind of constant bloodshed and violence and callousness towards human life that was very much a part of life in the you know first millennium AD. Uh, it's it's it was pretty nasty, and so this is a fairly brutal film in terms of that. I mean, the subject matter involves revenge and and you know slaughter, and uh, you know we're dealing with Vikings who are famous for raping and pillaging and stuff. So you're going to get that, but I think that it really, you know, a lot. Of, it's very easy to kind of glamorize that sort of uh, warrior mentality. These uh, these glamorous, you know, honor bound warriors. And he doesn't do much of that. It's very, it's played straight. It's played that this is a violent and brutal life. And although they have their code of honor, like it's not a nice time to be alive. And I like that. I appreciated that. Oh, well, you know, as a, as a woman, it's a little less enticing to me, but um, I, I really wanted to talk about our theater experience for this. I don't know what your audience was like, and I hope you'll tell me in a minute. Our theater was pretty packed. It wasn't one of the larger theaters within this cinema, but it was pretty packed and there were women next to Joe who were there clearly to just see Scar's guard shirtless and, you know, who did whenever he was on screen. I don't know why they didn't give Ethan Hawke more of a fanfare. And I was like annoyed by that because I'm like, you do realize that Ethan Hawke is here too, right? <laughs> but um, that really annoyed us. And I, I feel like they didn't know what the assignment was. Like they did not know what they were getting in for. Uh, what kind of audience did you have? Was it like artsy types? Was it people that were uh, devotees of the director? Uh, tell me about it. Well, I went to see it in the art theater in DC at about two in the afternoon on a weekday. So there was nobody in the theater. There were like three other people in the theater and they were pretty quiet. Um, that's, you know, mentioning Skarsgård with his shirt off, I will say, I think uh, the one place where this film fails in historic accuracy is that the people are far more beautiful than people in ninth century Scandinavia would, would have definitely been. That's one place where it feels a lot more modern. Yeah, the hard living for, for everyone back then, for sure, when you see people's hair and it's like nicely brushed. It's like, hmm. I don't know if they'd have they'd have time to do that. I don't think anyone really looked like Anya Taylor Joy or Nicole Kidman back in those days. Yes. Or okay. So I want to know who else is an Ethan Hawke fan. Put it in the comments. Let us know. Did you like this film? What else have you been watching lately? All right, Logan. Uh, Joe and I last night we saw everything, everywhere, all at once. It was fine. What have you seen lately, or what will you be seeing next? 
I don't know. Um, I canceled my movie theater subscription over during COVID because I wasn't willing to do what they are asking me to do to go to the theater. So I need to get back into seeing what's coming out um, and yeah. seeing what's next. Uh, I haven't really been in the theater much in the last few weeks, but I definitely wanted to see this one in the theater because I thought it was an important film. And one of the before we conclude on this, I just wanted to say for the sake of balance, one of the things that um, kind of held me back from loving it as much as I loved his previous films was apart from the predictability of the plot was I felt like there was such a kind of grim stoicness about stoicism about the characters that everybody was a little bit flat. I mean, the, the performances were good, but there wasn't as much opportunity for really like great acting performances. You didn't have those wild, loopy monologues that Willem Dafoe gave in The Lighthouse. You didn't have the range of emotion that people saw in, in The Witch. It was more like everybody's just grim and angry all the time. Um, so that like it was emotionally a little bit flat for me in that respect, but otherwise I really liked it. So I'd say I don't like it as much as his previous films, but it's definitely worth seeing. And if you're a fan of Robert Eggers, it doesn't disappoint. So I would recommend it. It's very quotable too. Uh, Nicole Kidman at the very beginning, I think her first dialogue of line is something to the extent of, I told you never to enter my bedchambers without invitation. And so now, like, every time my husband comes into our room, I love saying that. So I hope that that catches on. I hope that that's a meme. It's so campy the way that she says it, too. It's It's got some mad Sunset Boulevard vibes. Uh, Sunset Boulevard is a good movie. It, it is. And, you know, I have, a, I have an intense love of everything camp. And while that's a classic, uh, that's an absolutely classic film, you know, Norma Desmond, she's she's got some camp to her. And so does Nicole Kidman in this. Okay, well, we will be back soon with another exciting episode of Film Boya Bays. Yeah, we've got some ideas of things we want to do. So hopefully we'll get to film some more in the near future and put out some more videos regularly. I know it's been a little bit of a while since our last one. Yeah, we're trying to find our sea legs after COVID kind of derailed things. And now that Logan and I are watching the same things again, we have an episode or two-part episode coming up. So stay tuned and get in on that. It's taken a good bit of research for us to kind of be able to shoot what we're going to shoot. Anything else? That's all for me. We'll see you next time, guys. Thanks for watching. Keep it real.